Thank you for having me. Of course, it's a real pleasure to be here and always contributing um, to all the, the research and development that's ongoing with Stell Life and how it pairs with uh, PRF and all the work that we do. Um, so just a little note about myself, for those that have never met me in person or, or know my background, um, obviously I'm a dentist and I've done a lot of perio training in Bern, Switzerland. I'll introduce um, our team, but more specifically, I think I'm more mostly well known for my PhD in molecular and cell biology. And one thing that we do is we try and develop new products, new biomaterials, new dental implants. And I had the distinct honor in 2009 to move to Switzerland. As a Canadian, I, I was awarded a scholarship that permitted me to go anywhere in the world. And uh, I went to Switzerland. I was funded for five years, but I ended up staying for seven. And uh, I did a lot of work with these two gentlemen. So I was there till 2016. And both Tony Schoolian has done a lot of work with Emdogain and periodontal regeneration and later platelet-rich fibrin. Uh, of course, with Dr. Boozer, a lot of work with guided bone regeneration, with dental implants, bone grafting materials, and uh, collaborated a lot on the biology side with people uh, such as Dieter Bosart, as well as uh, Reinhard Gruber. So I always like to give uh, my team credit, and uh, it's great to, to go back and forth between Switzerland and the United States. I moved back to uh, North America and relocated to um, Florida, where I own a private practice and we do a lot of work as well. And I'll speak a little bit more about what I do personally from day to day basis. But one of the things that I'm most proud of in my entire career is the work that we've done with um, PRF. And uh, back 15 years ago when we started, uh, it was a novel field. You know, it was something that was new. I, I was bringing something that I was interested in to the University of Bern. Um, today, the University of Bern's ranked number one in the world in in academics and in citations per paper and research related to the expertise in platelet-rich fiber and myself and many of our colleagues are, are you know, doing a lot of research in this space because it is a growing field. Um, in 2021, I wrote this book here, Understanding Platelet-Rich Fibrin. It was kind of a second generation of the book, uh, a lot of collaborations, and uh, very, very happy to see that um, last year, it was the most sold textbook in the world by Quintessence um, in the dental uh, market. And I think, you know, it's a it's a big and growing field. And I think if you do anything in the implant dentistry world, of course, play the rich fiber, and there's a lot of value to adding that to your practice. So what is PRF? What is PRP? Um, essentially, in a nutshell, and I don't want to go into much detail, because I'm sure a lot of people are very familiar with the technology. We're able to separate cells based on their density. And uh, as a molecular and cell biologist years ago, that was my main focus was figuring out, you know, at what G-force, at what RPM, where do the cells go? What are they doing? And so that's internationally what I'm well known for. And of course, I think our team in Bern has done the best research on platelet concentrates, so much so that medical groups actually respect our work. And I collaborate a lot with um, orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, and it's really opened up the scope of, of what I can do um, with some of these, these colleagues. So we actually, I actually work directly with uh, the U.S. Olympic orthopedic surgeon, who I'll present later. He was in my office actually Friday and Saturday. We we're doing a course together and treating a lot of people in this space. So it's kind of cool to see the technology being used for regenerative medicine, not only in dentistry. Um, of course, we're going to use a centrifuge. We're going to separate cells based on density. And, um, you know, it's a pretty straightforward process. If you're not currently using PRF in your offices, um, our education platform, prfedu.com, we teach courses all over the country and, and all over the world. I just got back from a European trip where, you know, our main focus is really to get this technology into the offices as many practices as we can, both dental as well as medical, and really, you know, understand what what the benefit is. I always tell people, you know, the body is truly an amazing thing. We have this amazing intrinsic ability to heal ourselves. And if we can take our ability to heal ourselves, super concentrate it, and then use it for regenerative purposes, there's a lot of benefits. So it's a fast, simple procedure. Um, it's not very expensive. Once you have a centrifuge in your office, the cost per patient is, you know, $10 US. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very useful. So before we get into um, all of the dental applications of it and how we can combine this with different uh, biomaterials and or how we use it with products such as Stell Life. 
it's really interesting to see you know how efficient the body is at healing itself and looking at the medical applications of this technology so as a researcher you know who spent a lot of time separating cells based on density it's pretty cool to see these applications being used in fields such as um, medicine and for instance whether it be diabetic ulcers and or uh, this type of instance where this person right here had a um, uh, an ulcer on her toe, which turned out to be cancerous, um, it needed to be removed. And the surgical dermatologist told her, I can do a skin graft, but I'm not too sure how well that's going to take. And uh, the patient who was actually one of my friends, uh, was one of my friend's wife. Uh, and of course, in Florida, there's a lot of skin cancers. Um, she was told that there was a 50-50 chance the skin graft would take. And the reason why is the surgical dermatologist was not sure if there'd be enough blood flow going to the area in order to heal this type of defect. And if you think about it, your heart is, you know, way up here in your body, it's on the left hand side. This is literally your baby toe on the right foot. I mean, it could not be, it's literally the furthest place away from your heart. And so not sure if you could get enough blood flow to the area for the skin graft to take. Um, she said, listen, I take no meds. I'm a healthy young female. I'm 40 years old. Um, let's do the skin graft. Okay, I take no meds. There's no reason why this shouldn't take. Uh, and unfortunately, it did not take in her case. She was part of the negative 50%. And for her, the surgical dermatologist said, you know, we're gonna have to amputate your, your toe. And it's all related to blood flow. And so knowing that I was doing research in this space, um, my friend actually reached out to me and said, listen, you know, Natalie has this defect. It's related to blood flow. Um, you know, I thought he was going to send me a photo of something related to dental work, obviously. Um, you know, personally, I thought it was going to be an Austrian approach to the jaw case. I remember listening to him on the phone and I said, don't worry, Scott, just send me a photo. He sent me a photo and it was a, a toe. And I, I told Scott, I said, listen, Scott, I only treat like from the neck up, right? Uh, we don't do cases like that. I mean, Scott's not in, in medicine or dentistry. Um, but he just said, listen, Natalie is, you know, crying in the background. You know, can you do anything at all? Why don't you just give it any chance? It's got to be amputated in two weeks. So <clears throat> knowing that I had friends that were working on this type of defect, um, what they were doing was they were creating these custom shape PRF graphs, essentially, we call these biographs. And these can be created, you know, pretty easily. Um, there's protocols designed specifically for this. So we create these biographs. Um, place it on the defect. And in this case here, we never use regular gauze. You know, the one thing that I remember, because I've never done this before in my life, I asked my medical friends, how would you do it? And they said, Dr. Myron, it's very simple. You're going to make your clot, you're going to apply it on the defect, make sure you use nonstick gauze. If you use regular gauze, the PRF is going to literally get sucked into the uh, the gauze, but if you use nonstick gauze, it's going to push the growth factors towards a defect. And I said, okay, that makes sense. And then they told me, you know, make sure you wrap it, make sure it's nice and stable, uh, put some tape around it, etc. So, you know, not knowing what the hell I was doing, I just wrapped the toes up, uh, trying to get it stable, then wrapping the entire foot up. Um, and, uh, you know, I was told from the medical doctor, leave it there for one week, after one week, go back and reevaluate. If you, there's defects is still there, do another one. So after one week, when I took that off, this was actually the defect. And for me, it really, really shocked me a lot because um, it was, I mean, it was mind blowing. I mean, we had used PRF a lot in, in dentistry, around implants, for soft tissues, for different procedures. But to actually, you know, see a case like this that I had done, and I literally saved somebody from getting a toe that was amputated. I mean, for me, that was a, a big deal. And it was really the eye opening case for me personally, where I was like, the body is truly this amazing thing with this intrinsic ability to heal itself. Um, this is the case before and after. And like I said, I've, I don't do these cases, obviously, as a dentist. But you know, it was my friend, she was getting an amputated. Um, when she went back into the surgical dermatologist two weeks later to get it amputated, you know, he had reserved out the hospital bed and they were going to put her under and this and that. And uh, of course it shocked that, that surgical dermatologist a lot. And uh, he called me and, and basically I told Natalie, let him know my phone number. I'm like, I'm shocked too. Um, and uh, it all comes down to the fact that this person could not get the blood cells and the blood flow to that area. Um, the graft did not take and healing could not occur 
because you could not get platelets and or leukocytes to the area to fight infection. We just drew the tubes of blood, brought super concentrated those leukocytes and platelets, brought them to the area and sure enough healing happened. Um, that surgical dermatologist fast forward, you know, this was done four years ago. Um, you know, two years ago, that surgical dermatologist is actually the person that today teaches courses on how to do this uh, for other surgical dermatologists and also wrote the book chapter um, in our Understanding PureF book. So these are just examples of cases. You know, these are complex cases, obviously, but again, related to blood flow. This is a diabetic person, um, very serious defects. You get this infected and that's an amputation um, all day long. And there are doctors that are out there that will literally create these you know, biographs is what we call them, where, you know, there's specific protocols that, you know, we've created where you are going to super concentrate platelets and leukocytes. Um, we've created custom shaped trays that doctors can use the circular ones, of course, that you see there for diabetics, uh, the square ones we use a lot in dentistry, which we'll show later. And um, now I've got a fibrin clot that's much stronger because obviously we've super concentrated for brinogen and thrombin to make a super fibrin clot with entrapment of platelets and um, platelets and growth factors in the exact shape that I'd like. Okay, so here's going to be a little video of Dr. Marco Castro Pinto. He's the doc that's treated a lot of these cases here. And um, here's a little video of how that's done. So again, you're going to draw this up in uh, what we call liquid PRF tubes. So the ones that are made more hydrophobic that allow for clotting to be delayed. And uh, once that's drawn up and now that it's exposed to oxygen, just like when you cut yourself, a clot's going to form. Um, he's going to wait for that to clot. Now he's got his biograft. Um, you can see with this patient, this is a patient that had a defect on the bottom of their foot. Uh, has not healed for more than six months. You can see just by their feet how white they are. I mean, this is a very diabetic person and uh, going to take the biograft, apply it to the area. Again, non-stick gauze pad will be placed over top of that. And next thing you know, um, you know, that's after one treatment a couple of weeks later. So again, you're taking advantage of the body's ability to heal itself. Now, the one thing about our Understanding PureF book, which for those that don't know much about the technology, I highly uh, recommend you guys consider uh, getting it uh, simply because the book comes with all of these videos. So they're all linked to QR codes, which teach people how to do this protocol properly, how to make the sticky bone properly. And it's all described within, within the book. Um, before we get into dentistry, this is uh, Dr. Robert Talek and uh, you know, he's the U.S. Olympic orthopedic surgeon. He was in my office this weekend. We were doing a course, two other medical doctors and orthopedic surgeons. And he was one of the first people in the world to utilize this technology in his space. And more specifically, um, with respect to ALB PRF, so ALB-PRF. And he was using it to repair these very complex intervertebral discs using ALB PRF, a novel autologous technique that may prevent patients more extensive uh, surgery. So when we look at this type of case right here, this is a person that has a spine uh, with a tear. Um, and that's a very, very painful thing. I mean, I've seen patients that have had this type of, of problem. They're in all kinds of pain. It reminds me of somebody that needs a root canal. Uh, but if you think of a root canal, it's a tiny little, you know, one millimeter size opening in the tooth. And that's causing all kinds of pain on one single nerve. Um, in these cases here, this is a huge defect. There are, you know, many more nerves that are coming down and up your spine. These people are in all kinds of pains when they have this kind of problem. And historically, they would do a big surgery where they'd cut down the middle of their back, you know, open them up, uh, go in there with a piece of plastic, try and cover it. It was literally a $120,000 U.S. procedure. And I've seen Dr. Talek do this via video. Um, very, very invasive, obviously. And and then you have to put these little screws in place. And then, you know, he would years ago add some PRP or liquid PRF and suture everything closed and tell the patients they'd lie down for the next six months while healing would happen. And, uh, you know, Dr. Talek, when you see his CV, you know, he's also a MD, PhD, graduate from the Mayo Clinic in Cleveland, Cleveland Hospital. I mean, could not be uh, more well qualified. In fact, he's written seven textbooks, had 11 big NIH grant. I mean, he was a professor doing a lot of research, much like myself. 
And the one thought process he had was, well, since the body has an amazing ability to heal itself, you know, he was the first to take on this new alb PRF and use it for such defects. What is alb PRF? Um, for those that don't know what that is, and I'll show cases of how we use this in dentistry and uh, actually a recent publication that we just had accepted. Um, it's a novel PRF formulation that is actually heated, which makes the PRF last four to six months instead of two weeks. So it lasts a lot longer. And uh, I'll show a little video of how this is used and then later on how we use this in dentistry. But, you know, here's an example um, of the Alpura. I'm just going to take the sound off there. Um, it's it's in a heating machine. So this is a heater. You can see the PRF looks very different. It's now been heated um, and it's denatured albumin. And the, it takes the body four months to break this down. So once it's heated, we put it in the cooler to cool it down because it's too hot, obviously, to put back in a patient. But of course, when you heat at these high temperatures, you're going to kill every cell and every growth factor. So nothing will survive that. So what we've done a lot of work in and pioneered this research was we take the albumin gel that's heated and regular liquid PRF from the Buffy coat, and we're going to mix these back together back and forth um, in order to infuse the albumin gel that's been denatured. And you can see it being passed there with all of the liquid growth factors from standard liquid PRF so that it still has the regenerative potential, but it's infused inside a biomaterial that's going to last four to six months. Okay, so once you mix this back and forth, and you don't want to go too quickly because you don't want to damage the cells that are alive, but we mix it back and forth 10 times. And in a case like this right here, um, you know, this is the, the, the I'm not going to call it a surgical approach, but um, the patient is awake. This is a C-arm scanner right here. So he's calculated with the MRI where the injury is located, what side he needs to enter from. He's going to go in and you can see him here. He's saying x-ray. And then he's taking x-rays with the C-arm scanner here, making sure he's in the right plane. He's going to advance a little bit, take another x-ray. So um, he's going to take a few x-rays around the way. And then now you can see, look, there's a needle in the right location. Once that's in the right location, he's going to then take the ALPRF, which is going to make going to last four to six months. His hypothesis years ago was, well, if there's a defect of that size, if I can just inject something that's going to last four to six months, and it's also going to clot, I can cover the defect. It's going to clot after a 50 minute period. So the, the patient will stay there and wait. Once it's clotted, as long as it's blocked the hole and there's no more fluid motion in and out, the patient can literally walk up right after this is done. And um, the body has an intrinsic ability to heal itself. So over the next four months or so, the body is slowly going to close that defect on its own. Um, and I mean, this is really an amazing, amazing technology. He's teaching this in a lot of different places around the world. Um, he'll tell you straightforward. I mean, this is 15 minutes after. No. Okay, the other leg. Okay, Perfect. just ask him if he's in pain. And and I've seen him do this live where they just okay, get up come and back to me. walk out. I mean, it's really an amazing, amazing thing. Um, it works probably in, okay. he says, 70% of cases. But you know what? If Even if you have to still do 30% uh, surgeries, the fact that you can eliminate somebody from laying in a bed for six to nine months in 70% of these cases with a simple little injection like that, you know, it's pretty amazing. And, um, you know, this is something that he sent me during the, right after the U.S. Olympics, actually. And in this case here, these are two professional golfers. These are the Corda sisters. And um, the one that's on the left-hand side there, she's the number one golfer in the world. And unfortunately for her, um, she had a spinal tear and golf is a horrible, horrible sport for people's spines because they're always whipping around. And, you know, if you follow golf or you follow Tiger Woods' career, I mean, if he wouldn't have had these back injuries and spinal injuries, his career would have been even exponentially more prolific than it already is. And it's really his spinal injuries that have, that derailed his career. And back then, they only knew one thing, you do surgery. And when Tiger Woods got his first surgery, uh, little improvements, but then needed another one and another one. And, and long story short, you know, he's a person that tells other golfers, listen, whatever you do in your early careers, don't do back surgery. So 
Unfortunately for the Corda sister, she had a spinal tear. Um, she was told that she needed surgery. Um, she wasn't inclined to do it. And she was at a point in her career where she was ready to just retire as opposed to do these surgeries and be a little crippled for the rest of her life. She didn't want that. And she had already accomplished a lot of things in her career that she was satisfied with. But she consulted with the U.S. Olympic orthopedic surgeon, who's Dr. Talek. Dr. Talek said we have alternative options. He did a spinal injection. A month after that, she was training again for the Olympics. And four months after that, she won the Olympics. And um, when she won the Olympics and was on the cover of Golf Digest, um, she, they they wrote to him specifically, dear Talek family, because his wife is a nurse that works with them. You are the PRF that holds us together. And, um, you know, it's kind of a attribute. I remember the day that he took a photo of that and received it. Um, you know, he sent me a picture of it personally and told me, look, Rick, without the technology that was that you invented basically at the University of Bern, um, this person's career would have practically been over. And, um, you know, it's pretty cool to see that what we invented in the field of dentistry to basically create membranes that we would that would last four to six months. So I could in our practices, we could replace collagen membranes um, entirely. Uh, it would be used on professional athletes to save their careers. Right. So we'll get into some of the dental applications um, and how we use this technology as well. Now, there's been a lot of improvements in the field over the years, right from PRP all the way up to where we are today with BioPureF. I'm not going to go through it. Like I said, we teach full day courses on, you know, what the technology is, how it's been advanced and how we've improved it. Um, but, you know, the the main difference is anticoagulants, removal of anticoagulants, slower speeds, um, liquid version now, and then horizontal centrifugation leading to four times more cells and growth factors. So if you really want to do this uh, properly, of course, you need the right devices and understand the differences between RPM and, and G-Force and, and how to spin correctly for different indications. Um, this paper here that we published in 2019 is probably the most important one that I've ever published in my career. And it's also the most cited one that I've published in the PRF world. Um, a novel method for evaluating and quantifying cell types in platelet-rich fibrin and an introduction of horizontal centrifugation. So four years ago, we launched uh, the ability to do horizontal centrifugation. And um, for those that don't understand this fully just yet, essentially in a nutshell, when you look at a, a fixed angle centrifuge, like an interest, interest spin, um, the G-force is always calculated, whatever the G-force is at the min of the tube versus the max of the tube. And whatever the separation is between the two of them, that's how well the, the layers will separate. So naturally, if you can create a machine that would literally swing out and go horizontally, you can maximize that and then get more efficient separations of cells and uh, growth factors. If anybody's interested in this, like I said, you can even go to YouTube and just type in, you know, my name with with just basic research science, explaining the technology in full. Like I said, I don't want to waste uh, the time of anybody this evening explaining what that is. But um, very important to separate these cells properly, and um, we'll use this to separate out uh, cells efficiently. And that's the whole technology that we've created at BioPureF. And this is what it looks like. So for those that are unfamiliar, the tubes, they still go in up and down. But when this thing starts spinning quickly, not it's no longer on a 45 degree angle. It literally swings out, goes horizontally, and then the layers can separate a lot more effectively. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why our research team is very well known. You know, on a fixed angle centrifuge, all the cells are basically, when the G-force is spinning quickly, they get bunched up at the back here. You do not get proper separations of cells and growth factors um, because they're all bunched up there. And, and uh, when you go horizontal, you can get a much better separation. And it just, just from this diagram, it's very logical of how that works. And this is one of the figures that's shown most frequently by other colleagues uh, in our space. If you actually look at a fixed angle centrifuge, you'll note here, the layers never separate properly. You always have like an angle, the way that it's separated. And if you look at all the little red dots here, where do you find them? You find them on the back. You don't find them on the one side. You don't find them on the other side. And the reason why is that fixed angle. When you started spinning fast, you're literally driving all the cells against the back there and you're not getting proper separation. So, you know, that was a technology that we've improved quite a bit um, over the years. Um, not going to get into too much more 
much too much scientific detail on red top tubes versus blue or white top tubes. In a nutshell, one of them is made hydrophilic to induce for clotting. The other one is made hydrophobic to keep it liquid. So there's basically a way that with the same spin cycle, you can have one tube that's already clotted after the spin and we can use those as membranes as we do in dentistry. The other side, we could have a tube that would stay liquid and we can use that for other regenerative purposes. Other things that affect clotting are, there's three things. So number one, the tube type that you use, on one side hydrophilic, the other side hydrophobic. The second thing you can do is you oxygenate the tube. So what that means is on one side, you pop the lids and you allow oxygen to go into that sample. On the other side, no oxygen. And then very simple, like when you cut yourself, it's actually the air that helps induce cl clots to form. So that's the second thing. The third thing is temperature. And a lot of people don't know this. And I'm, you know, it's really a pity that more clinicians don't utilize this technology because it is so valuable in, in practice and so cheap to add. Like for 200 US dollars, um, I can guarantee that we can make things clot faster or slower just based on understanding temperature. So fibrinogen plus thrombin makes a fibrin clot. And that's a one-way process. When you make a fibrin clot, it never goes backwards. And that whole process is controlled by enzymes. Enzymes do not work well at cold temperatures. So if I take a tube of blood and I put it in a cooling device, and we call that the biocool, it'll maintain its liquid properties for hours. And we've shown that if you take literally tubes of blood and you put it in this little biocool device, it'll stay liquid in this right here for four hours plus. So that's great for orthopedic surgeons like Robert Talek or facial aesthetic doctors, plastic surgeon that prefer the liquid. Or if you're a dentist that's doing joint injections, TMJ joint injections, that's beautiful because it stays liquid for as long as you want for half a day. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, if you were to heat the PRF up, it's going to clot a lot more effectively and much faster. So when clinics call and they say, oh, you know, we're not getting a clot, we're not getting this, we're not getting that, all they would need to do is heat heat this up somehow. So we published this paper here, and it's been years that we've shown this, October 2020. Um, a couple of colleagues, custom 3D bone allograft block fabrication, just like you can 3D print or, or design, 3D design where your implants are going, you can also do the same and make a custom bone graft template. And we do this where we create this custom 3D print bone graft, put the bone graft in there, and, and there's our implant guide. That's our bone graft guide. The bone particles go in the middle here, scrunch them up. What do I do with this? When it's got the PRF to make the shape, I place that in an incubator. You put that in an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius, that's body temperature, it will clot much stronger to the point where this is what we 3D plan. This is what we made. And you can literally take that and bang it on a table. It's going to stay nice and solid. And then we can use that for regenerative purposes and just make our life a whole lot easier. Um, very, very important. And, you know, if even if you don't have these technologies, you can literally take, you know, a, a liquid PRF one and put it in a cup of water that's cold. You can literally, if you have a solid PRF, so you have a red top tube and you want it to clot faster, just take the tube and put it in a cup of hot water and it will clot much faster just based on increasing the activity of these enzymes. Um, so in dentistry, you know, we're going to cover very quickly where we use PRF. You know, it can be used in extraction sites. This is primarily for third molars where we make these plugs and use them. The nice thing about PRF is it's part of your body. It can be left exposed in the oral cavity. So even if we do a tooth that we plan to do an implant in, of course, there's a bone allograft mixed with PRF below this. We can use PRF over top of that without having to necessarily use a PTFE membrane and or a collagen membrane and not have to worry about this being exposed. This is this is fully integratable. Um, the only issue that you may have with this is if you do too much rinsing with something like chlorhexidine, that might you know damage the PRF. And we'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about implants. Use frequently in sinus grafting, right? Um, if you can create these you know, great bone grafts, and they call it sticky bone, obviously, for those that don't know it, you know, there's a lot of advantage to that not having particles flying around a little bit everywhere. 
and um, very used very frequently. I like to, in these cases here, show some of Do Dr. Michael Picos's cases, um, who's a very close colleague of ours. And uh, this is his case right here. It's in our textbook as well, where, you know, he does surgery very, very, uh, I mean, one of the best surgeons I've ever seen in my life and have, has, have had the pleasure to work with. And uh, in his cases, like I said, if you just add the platelet concentrates in there and make your sticky bone correctly, it's going to improve the graft material handling. You're going to increase angiogenesis in the sinus grafting procedure and um, very, very useful for soft tissue healing. So cut up these membranes first, mix it with the bone graft, add the liquid PRF, and then use it for regenerative purposes, very, very common procedures. I'm not going to go step by step. I think Dr. Michael Picos's book on bone augmentation and plant dentistry is a great way for surgeons to learn all the uses of this. This right here, one of my favorite uses of PRF in the field of dentistry, um, where you know you create these, um, and this is a nice video here with Dr. Nate Estrin, who's a periodontist that I've had the pleasure to work with for over uh, almost two years now. And in these cases here, you know, in our practices, we're going to create little uh, incisions through this and the abutment's going to go through that. And this can be done for first stage surgery, second stage implant placement. Um, in those cases there, what are you trying to do? You're trying to create basically a barrier for this from the soft tissue. So even if you try and proximate tissues around abutments, you're never going to get like perfect primary closure because bacteria are literally microns in sizes and they can squeeze in there and they want to go to the rough and implant surface. So by doing it in this fashion um, and just basically creating, you know, cutting a little hole, this is called the poncho technique, putting the abutment through, you know, you got a slime ball here that's exposed and that's greatly going to prevent them. I mean, imagine how is the bacteria supposed to go through this now and go attach to the roughened portion of an implant surface where the bacteria will be very, very happy to replicate there and, and create quote unquote perimplantitis by simply doing this with one PRF membrane. And you know a, a tube of PRF costs literally a dollar each. So by using the technology, you know, you can do a lot of great things for your patients in cases like this. Now, you know, when we want to optimize. Everything, you know, I always talk to our residents about um, stacking things in your favor. This is a big one that, you know, we we did research on many years ago. I mean, before Stella Life existed, before I met Stella Life or Michael Picos, you know, in Bern, Switzerland, we were doing this research looking at how damaging antiseptic solutions uh, were in dentistry and how they affected bone viability and other things. This was some of our team members and myself. There's a senior author with uh, published in Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery back in 2016. And the one thing that we learned in this study was every single one of these antiseptic solutions was killing more than 50% of my cells about, tr entrapped in bone chips within a 10 second rinse. And um, it was very, very damaging. And when we did studies like this, just preliminary studies with platelet concentrates, no cells that were entrapped in a little fiber mesh would be able to survive rinses that were performed with any of these different solutions. They were all very damaging. And um, I remember moving back to United States uh, later that year, uh, meeting uh, a fellow colleague, Michael Picos. And uh, Dr. Picos had told me that, you know, he, he was not using chlorhexidine. And he had heard of Stella Life and wanted, you know, he had told me that it was working very well in his hands. And of course, you know, as a researcher, uh, I like to test everything because it's just the way that our brains are designed. But the minute I saw him talk about that, I said, give me a couple of these tubes. I want to take it back to Switzerland and I'm going to reperform the same studies that I'd done years ago. And I did that with the same Japanese scholars that I was working with in this paper, which was published in 2020. Um, cytotoxicity and gene expression changes of a novel homeopathic antiseptic oral rinse in comparison to chlorhexidine. We literally took the Stella Life and put it side by side with uh, chlorhexidine. And again, with this 10 second rinse, everything was dying. The cells were actually staying alive with Stella Life. And we did this, uh, you know, what I thought was quite interesting. I started to dilute with our team, both Stella Life and chlorhexidine from the final clinical concentration. So I took both and I diluted it 
in normal, uh, you know, cell culture media that we use, 0.1%, everything stayed alive. When I diluted both to 1%, everything stayed alive. When we diluted to 10%, chlorhexidine started to kill things, which means that when chlorhexidine comes in a solution, typically in North America of 0.12% chlorhexidine, 0.012%, so even if you diluted it tenfold, would still kill cells. And so it's it's extremely toxic. And um, you know, one thing as a PRF educator was I never wanted anybody that was using platelet-rich fibrin to be using chlorhexidine because for myself, for our research, for even for our credibility, um, you know, I didn't want somebody to say, we're talking about how great PRF is helping with soft tissue healing. And then somebody's using chlorhexidine, it's not working quite as well as other people are saying. And we've really adapted a philosophy where you know, we need to use things that are uh, better than chlorhexidine essentially in the office. And we've completely removed use of chlorhexidine entirely. Um, Stella Life is a great alternative solution uh, to that problem. It's what we use exclusively. Other people will tell me, you know, I was in Europe lecturing in, in Switzerland very recently. They said, Dr. Myron, we got this one product, um, very similar potentially. I mean, it's not available in North America. We've never tested it, but pretty much everywhere around the world, they've they've realized that if you use PRF, you know, you do not want to use something like chlorhexidine and, that, and those types of treatments. And when we actually studied the mechanisms of action of uh, Stella Life versus chlorhexidine, of course, we sell, see a lot of our cells that are dying. But the one most important finding was this one right here. When we actually looked at what the cells were doing, you know, they may have been producing like 50% more collagen with Stell Life with nothing chlorhexidine, but this one here was the one that was very eye-opening. When we actually looked at the way what the cells were, um, you know, the the mRNA levels of these cells, TNF alpha was increased by 2000 fold. So there was a 2000 fold increase in inflammation when cells were exposed to chlorhexidine. And, and, you know, I've done a lot of research in my life. Um, you know, when we look at BMPs and how they improve bone formation, it's usually a six-fold and MDOGAIN for perio, it's three-fold and PRF for soft tissue, it's five-fold. Um, when we actually looked at how bad this was for cells, I mean, these levels are extremely high. And I actually think today that if you give patients chlorhexidine as a rinse, following third molar extractions in young people, um, they're more likely to be in a lot more pain and suffer from pain, want to take more opioids, which um, to the lack of my knowledge, uh, which was not used as frequently in Europe, is used a lot here in North America and seems to be a big problem. And you, you read the reports of um, how a lot of these young people that are drug addicts first started opioids from doctors and primarily dentists prescribing them to them. So we try and avoid that as much as possible. Um, you know, I've done a lot of research in the space of, of immune cells and how they behave around biomaterials. Um, we've published some papers in 2016 titled Osteomax, Key Players Around Bone Biomaterials. Um, there, It just talks about how osteomacrophages really help with biomaterial integration. And around the year 2016, we started to realize that these, these immune cells are very, very important around dental implants and how they integrate. And um, in, this, in the year 2016, I, I spent a year in Michigan as an ITI fellow working with Homley Wang and a couple of other people. We published this article, Basis of Bone Metabolism Around Dental Implants During Austin Integration and Peri-Implant Bone Loss. And uh, we talked about low vitamin D levels and how immune cells are key regulators during dental implant osteointegration integration and maintenance and on and on and on. And I was very shocked to learn that this article, you know, I got this paper one day, congratulations, your article was one of our top downloaded articles in recent publication history. And uh, one of the top most downloaded, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was doing all this research with dental implants and PRF and Tetranite and this and that. And this paper, which I would consider to be quite boring, quite honestly, was basic research was the one that was being most downloaded by colleagues. And what I realized was that a lot of dentists and even academic dentists, they didn't understand how biomaterials integrate in the body. 
And when a dental implant goes into the body, a lot of people think because the original models that were presented by um, Jet Davies in Toronto, you know, it was all about contact osteogenesis and distraction osteogenesis. And everybody makes it seem like it's a very happy place where a dental implant goes in a bone and bone cells go attached and they make bone. But in reality, it's not like that at all. When you look under a microscope, when you place a dental implant into the body, I mean, it is a, a foreign body object and it's not really supposed to be there. And the first cells that come in contact with any implanted biomaterial is immune cells. And if those immune cells are properly regulated and they're happy and they like the biomaterial, they will literally say, okay, bring in, bring in the stem cells, bring in the osteoblast, make some bone, everybody's happy. Um, when they're unhappy, um, they just say fibrous encapsulate, spit this thing out of the body. So we've done a lot of work in the space and quite honestly, a lot of individuals don't know this, but one of the leading causes of early dental implant failure is related to vitamin D deficiency. And um, it's kind of silly to say this, but we all know that vitamin D is the vitamin for bone. I mean, if you become osteoporotic, your parents do or whoever does, the first thing a doctor is going to say is, hey, make sure you take your vitamin D, uh, vitamin K, and we'll talk more about supplements. Um, but there was also some research on how important it was for other things. Uh, related to diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, and other things. And so when you look at the vitamin D deficiency and all the links between alopecia and Alzheimer's and asthma and cardio disease and depression, diabetes, hypertension, it looks a lot like the association with periodontal disease. And the reason why is both of them affect the immune system. Um, and um, it was interesting during COVID, during COVID, the CDC published some of this work where they said, you know what, vitamin D deficiency is a global pandemic, coronavirus is spreading, vitamin D is a proven powerful immunomodulator, important for the immune system. And um, very critically, a lot of people were deficient, uh, low vitamin D levels found in 90% of individuals. This is reality of the world that we live in. And um, in the dental world, Vitamin D and, and bone physiology, I had never really seen these studies up until the point when we started publishing this stuff, but they did these studies in rat models where this is years ago, they would place a dental implant into a, a rat model and they do what's called a pull-up test. So they literally try and once the implant's integrated, they try and pull it out and they yank it out. And depending on how much force is required to actually pull it out, they get a, a value. And animals that were vitamin D deficient had a 66% reduction in their strength. And that's a huge number. And, um, you know, I've been part of a lot of dental implant studies where they've looked at pullout strengths. And for instance, when you look at, you know, SLA versus SLA active, you know, the hydrophilic stroman implant surfaces are Nobel, Nobel active, the bone implant contacts typically improve by, you know, 15% or so. And if you've got a better 15% more pullout strength, let's say, those companies will spend millions, billions of dollars to market this because they've got the solution, right? They've got a better dental implant surface. But meanwhile, if your patient is vitamin D deficient, there is a 66% reduction. And so, you know, the very obvious question is, what do you think is more important? You know, having your patient that's optimized and in health or having a, a super- hydrophilic implant surface. And, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that you can probably use a whole variety of dental implant surfaces, but you have to make sure and critical is the, the health of that patient. And unfortunately, since the majority of the population is vitamin D deficient, you know, that becomes a, a little problem inside clinical practice. And it was actually Reinhard Gruber, one of my former supervisors that showed the study more than 10 years ago. If you just took dietary vitamin D, integration improved and he was head of oral cell biology. I mean, I talked to him a lot about the studies that he had done and they found that if these, if they just supplemented, everything went back to normal and they were happy. But we started to see all these papers being published, vitamin D deficiency and early implant failure, case reports, um, other papers, vitamin D deficiency is suspected factor in failure of these immediate implants. So all these people started publishing a literature on this, but it wasn't until 
about five years ago that this really great paper was published, low serum vitamin D and early dental implant failures are a connection. And the reason why the paper was so well cited and, and downloaded was they did a huge study. So almost 2000 implants in almost a thousand patients. And when you look at the numbers, overall, there's a 4% failure rate, heavy smokers, okay, 15 cigarettes or more per day. I mean, that's a lot. 6% failure rate. So we know that smoking causing increases in failure, but it's 4% to 6%. That's a 50% increase. Same thing with generalized perio. There's a higher risk factor, but it's a 50% increase. Meanwhile, those with vitamin D deficiency, almost a 300% increase. And it was determined from the study that vitamin D deficiency was a higher risk factor for implant failure than smoking and generalized perio. So that opened up a lot of, you know, eyes. I'm not going to go through the vitamin D supplemental guidelines because, you know, we've got a very easy solution, but of course we've done all the literature and there's a lot of great papers available on this. Um, follow the guidelines from your own specific country. So for instance, the endocrine society in U.S., defines anybody below 30 is deficient, preferred range between 40 and 60 nanograms. All adults should take at least 2000 units per day. Um, if you're obese, you may need to take up to three times more. But here's the real kicker is that when you're really deficient, you want to be taking, you know, 5000 units per day. And in older people up to 10,000 is the limit. So um, in those cases there, that's the maximum you should really give somebody is 10,000 units based on the guidelines from the um, American Academy of Endocrinology. And, um, you know, there's these tools that are available even to us as dentists in office where you can measure vitamin D levels in office. And that's done with a simple finger prick. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but these are available where you can literally with a simple finger prick, get a few drops of blood. Okay, you put it in this little device right here and it, it looks like a COVID test. This video is way before COVID. It's from 2018 or 17. These have been around for 10 years. And just like the COVID test measures antibodies, there's ways that you can measure the vitamin D levels. It's done differently with a little cube reader and uh, it takes about 15 minutes to get an answer. But basically you can screen in your office and we have one of our assistants do these tests for us you know, screen how to get a reading for vitamin D. And at the end of the test here, what you're going to see here is the, the rapid reader vitamin D 50.2 nanograms per ml. Great. They're between 40 and 60. Let's go into surgery, right? It's just a little screening tool. Um, obviously, if you're sending them to labs to get the data or they have it, that's better. But, you know, this is a little screening tool we can use. We also know that antioxidants are important. I'm going to skip through this a little bit faster. Um, during surgery, there's a lot of stress and oxidative stress. So antioxidants are, are, I wouldn't say equally as important, but they are still important. A lot of people, uh, including Pat Allen, who's a very well-known periodontist, they've done a lot of work just talking about how the relationships between oxy antioxidants and how important they are. Um, and other people have, have shown in periodontal therapy, um, if you want to prevent periodontitis, you should have antioxidants, vitamin D and calcium and inadequate levels of any of the following will lead to issues. Um, you know, this is the, the reality of the world we live in in the United States, where a lot of the population is deficient in antioxidants and vitamin. And unfortunately, the vitamin for bone and your most powerful immunomodulator is the one that most people are deficient in. And that's a reason of, you know, in, in nature, we should have been spending a lot more time in the sun. And today nobody spends time in the sun because we're all indoors and a lot of deficiencies there. So I learned actually in, in the medical world that there was a product that has existed for more than 20 years called Vitamedica, which had very powerful antioxidants and plastic surgeons were recommending this before surgery. And, um, you know, again, if you go on the website, our number one selling recovery, 20 years, this is what it does. And they basically taught me that they don't do any surgery in plastic surgery without supplementing all patients before surgeries. And to me, because I was having these early implants that were failing um, and more that were failing when I moved back to Uni United States versus Switzerland, I started to say, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And um, Vitamedica doesn't have vitamin D levels inside that are adequate. Um, so I was using that with vitamin D supplements 
you know, long story short, as years progressed, they created a, a specialized one that was specific to dentistry. It's called Denta Medica, and um, it it was used before surgery. So we've tested this very, very heavily when I was in university at Nova. Um, other people have tested this independently out of private practice. I'll show some of the results. But the reality is, is that, you know, in our population, you know, this was a little bit scary, but I remember going to some conferences to learn a little bit more about vitamins because I knew this was going to be important for surgery. U.S. life expectancy was going actually downwards. And I remember going to this conference in 2017 and the lecturer had said, you know, life expectancy over the past three years has gone down every single year. And that's the first time in U.S. history that life expectancy has gone down three years in a row. And, um, you know, he, he made a point actually very, very, you know, really hit home with the audience. He literally said, guys, if you have a child born today, they will not live as long as you do. And if you have a grandkid that's born today, they will not live as long as you will. I mean, this is the real trends in the United States. And, um, you know, I've been asked personally to write book chapters on this. And we wrote one in 2021 where we looked at all the data. This is even before COVID where life expectancy in U.S. peaked in 2014 and never improved after that. And um, when you look at other countries like Switzerland, where I just came from, life expectancy has continued to go up all the way to the same years. And there was no dip like there was in the United States. In fact, in Switzerland, where I came from, people were literally living 10 years longer than they were in U.S. And Italy, you know, same thing no dips whatsoever. Even in Japan, where life expectancy is one of the highest ones in the world, there's no dip whatsoever. Why should there be a dip, right? In in a perfect world, science is getting better, hospitals are getting better, medical procedures are getting better, all of our medical products should be getting better, um, we should learn more about nutrition and health. Why should life expectancy go down? Um, but that's the case in the United States, right? People are working too much, they're more stressed out, um, and so, uh, you know, we're not, I'm not here to talk about life expectancy whatsoever by any means, but if we have a slightly more unhealthy population and we're responsible for placing dental implants in these people, and we know that the immune system is extremely important for implant osteointegration, you know, this is kind of bad news in the world that I live in where we're placing a lot of dental implants. Um, so, you know, we take this very seriously. Um, we, we supplement every single patient before surgery. I highly recommend that you guys do the same, um, because I think it's very, very important for people that are doing a lot of dental implants and or bone grafting surgeries. This was the study that was done in the white clinic by two colleagues. Uh, they're in Portugal, same problems that they were observing in their own practice. They actually compared two finger prick, uh, testers in their offices. So there's different companies that for years have been producing these types of devices, um, and also measured antioxidants. This right here is a graph that just shows the accuracy of these little devices. So this is your lab score from an actual lab of vitamin D levels. That's one finger prick test. That's the other one. So you can see pretty much everywhere throughout the study. Um, you know, you get a reading that's plus minus maybe four nanograms, but it's not perfect, but it's good enough to screen saying, you know, yes, they're in roughly the right zone or no, they need to supplement. And uh, from there, like I said, then we supplement accordingly. Those that took Dentamedica, uh, what they did was anybody that was deficient, they supplemented everybody with Dentamedica and 100% of them, you know, reached levels. 82% of the people that enrolled in the study were actually deficient at the beginning of the study, which is just a huge number, right? Same thing in the United States, 70% in our country, 82%, at least in this study when they were um, doing this and, and uh, a good number of them, one in about three were deficient in some form of antioxidant. So um, there's a whole protocol that was developed associated with this. And um, you can talk to the Stella Life uh, representatives about it because they realized that this would probably fit their, you know, healing from within uh, concepts. And um, this is something that we give all patients before surgery. So we typically give it to them four weeks before surgery. We say, take all your pills until they're done. So their vitamins, obviously, we get them to stop whatever vitamins they're currently taking. Stop that. We put them on medical grade, GMP uh, grade supplements. 
It's not a supplement that you can take for the rest of your life at the current dose. Okay. It's like a super dose. It's we're going into surgery together. The likelihood that you're deficient is pretty high in the United States. I don't want to take chances and I don't want to have a deficiency related to any one of these minerals or vitamin that's deficient. You're going to take this for four weeks before surgery. And then, you know, we do the surgery and we have a lot more confidence that, you know, the, there's not going to be a failure related to some small little issue related to it. Um, you know, Scott Froome is a close friend and, and colleague. I've gotten to know him more and more over the years. But, um, you know, February 3rd, 2020, he published this work and talking about vitamin D deficiency. And I thought it was real cool that he published this because it was actually before COVID, before everybody was talking about how important vitamin D is. He had published this article in Perio Implant Advisory talking about vitamin D deficiency and the impact on wound healing and implant failure and showed for himself what had happened in his cases where implant failure was 11.3% in deficient cases compared to 2.9% in patients with normal levels. And he showed cases where, you know, implants that were failing very, very early on, which, you know, that they had great implants, they had bleeding bone, everything was as advertised, but there's all these issues happening. And we had published a couple of work. This is probably the one that I think is most easy to read, um, published in Dentistry Today, which you can imagine as a, as a researcher, I'm not really one to publish too often in Dentistry Today, but one of the editors said, you know, Rick, he heard me lecture somewhere. This vitamin D topic is extremely important. We've got a lot of readership at Dentistry Today. Do you mind writing an article on this topic um, to, you know, tell clinicians what they should know. And uh, Mike Picos and Mark Bashar and I, we wrote this article, Vitamin E Deficiency and Early Implant Failure. It was literally titled, What Every Clinician Should Know. And it was just highlighting like, what is available? What is this finger prick test that you can do in your offices? Because most dentists don't know. Why do we supplement? What level should we be at before surgery? And just gave an overall, you know, picture on maybe you could save one or two cases out of 100 of the implants that you place. And quite honestly, even if you can improve 2% of your implant outcomes just by this simple little fix, totally worthwhile. And like I said, a lot of people have since done a lot of research in this space. And we just talked about the cases where, you know, you have, you may have great bone and bleeding bone and you're placing the same dental implants the same way you've always placed them and everything goes in and looks great. And next thing you know, one month post-op, it just looks like a uh, catastrophe went off, right? What happened here? Well, what happened is this patient was critically deficient in this case here in vitamin D. Um, that person's immune system was not having these foreign body objects into their body. And because their immune system couldn't cope with them, they just said, you know what? Destroy everything, spit this thing out. I don't want this in my body and away it goes. And um you know, we've done a lot of studies related to that. Um, interestingly, it was actually uh, my office manager that said, you know, we could actually collect some, uh, use some codes and collect money from insurance companies to either run the test or, you know, supplement and use it as a dispense sort of in office, uh, you know, drug, so to speak. So that's been passed and we were able to use that in a lot of cases with certain insurances. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about today is related to, um, the Alpuref technology, which I showed earlier with Robert Talek. So it's a slightly different spin cycle. Um, and you got to know a little bit more about the technology, but just know that this is available where we take the upper layer and we heat it and remix it back in with the Buffy coat, which has all the cells. And we create what's called Alpuref. And that's exactly what Dr. Talek showed. Um, when we did the animal studies related to this, this is, um, you know, if you're a researcher, this is very, very common, but it's called ISO 10993, and it tells you how long biomaterials last. So when they say like a collagen membrane will last uh, eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks, what do they do? They take the collagen membrane, they place it under the skin of an animal, so subcutaneously, and then every two weeks they go back in. Is the membrane still there? Is it still intact? Yes, good. Four weeks, it's still there. Six weeks. Oh, eight weeks, it's starting to break down. Oh, by 12 weeks, it's completely gone okay, that material gets an eight to 12 week period. Um, and that's how it gets FDA clearance for that. When you look at PRF, which was placed on this side here in this animal, in two weeks, it's gone. It's PRF will last two weeks. It's great for releasing growth factors on a short-term basis. 
but it's never it can never be used as a barrier membrane. Okay. Um, in this case here, when we actually heated the PRF, it was still there. It started to break down by four months and it was still there until six months. So um, it got a working classification of four to six months. It's fully biological. Like I said, there's not a single chemical associated with this. And um, we've started using a lot of different indications. So just to go over this, we draw out the upper layer, we heat it, we then mix it back in with the other layer. So that's the denatured albumin that's been cooked. That's the other layer. They get mixed back together, back and forth. You guys have already seen this, so I'm just going to skip these to save a little bit of time and show how it's being used in dentistry and other indications. So the first thing we did, and this video here comes from the year 2019 at the University of Bern. We in the University of Bern is the capital of Switzerland, and we deal with all of the serious trauma cases. And most of them honestly are related to like alpine ski accidents where people run into things and or run into trees and fracture their orbital rims and different things. Um, and with these oral maxillofacial surgeons, they were doing a lot of work with titanium meshes, but titanium meshes have a very high rate of exposure. So we were purposely, you know, they were always complaining. We had this technology. We knew it was lasting that long in animals. So we started to say, well, you know, your bioguide membranes, which is a Swiss company, Geislick, only last eight weeks. Why don't we create these membranes that are going to last four to six months and started putting this over top of titanium meshes? And this lasted much longer. And since then, we can we can change the shape and size, the thickness. Um, we can, Now we've since created these custom shapes. So there's been a lot of advantages. And um, it was actually with Dr. Michael Picos where we started to utilize this technology and we would literally create these extended PRF membranes. Now we call them EPRF membranes for extended PRF. And right to the EPRF membrane, you can build in your regular sticky bone. So the advantage of this is you could literally go to a ridge. There's your sticky bone to build the bone. There's your extended PRF membrane all together, um, all in one, and and you can use these for these regenerative purposes, which is really really great. Um, and here's a a case of a of an EPRF membrane. This is Dr. Allen that created this, and I'll I'll show you work that we published together. But this is just to show you the consistency. This is a a, a gentleman who actually teaches in some of our PRF EDU courses from Mexico, and he's using these membranes as a replacement to collagen. And when you know what you're doing you can use these which are made by the way for two dollars for two membranes and sub out collagen membranes um the picos institute you know he he obviously does much bigger surgeries than most people but you know i'll show you extreme cases where this is being used and and mike and i and, and dr allen and dr estrin we published this work actually this right here is literally from like four days ago i mean this is october 6 2023 We've got a real nice article that was accepted in Periodontology 2000 on extended platelet-rich fibrin. This is literally from four days ago. And uh, this should be online probably next week, I would guess. It's the first clinical study in dentistry ever published on using EPRF membranes as a substitute for collagen membranes. I believe uh, Dr. Picos will be presenting this um, at a symposium actually uh, this upcoming this upcoming weekend. Um, and he's done, you know, these amazing cases, which are way outside of the scope of anything I'd ever feel comfortable doing, but using these EPRF membranes to cover zygomatic implants. So this is the case from that actual publication where, you know, um, this primarily should be reserved for oral surgeons or people that are very comfortable with surgery, but, you know, not enough RBH left, not a lot of options and uh, they'll do these zygomatic implants. I mean, this is major, major surgery, way outside the scope of anything I would ever do, but what do you use to cover this, right? You can do different options. You can do, you can spend five, $600 in collagen membranes here. You can go remove the buccal fat pad, um, or you can create these EPRF membranes, which is what he showed in the split face, uh, um, this work that he did where, he would create these EPRF membranes and cover them over top of these very invasive surgeries here. So um, very cool to see. And like I said, you're making those membranes for, you know, under five, five US dollars and they heal up beautifully. Now, 
What we do in our office is um, obviously very, very different. These are videos that were published actually in our most recent implant book um, in a chapter that uh, Dr. Nathan Estrin and I wrote on Pure F. And these are cases that he performed. We, we worked out of the same office in Dr. Michael Canner's practice where we can create these membranes which can be left exposed in the oral cavity. They're nice because they last four to six months. There's protocols and, and ways to do this, obviously. But these are just examples of case series studies that are going to be published also very shortly where we create these membranes that will we can make them the thickness that we'd like, leave them exposed in the oral cavity. Obviously, in cases like this, we do not use chlorhexidine, right? I mean, I could beat somebody's head over and over just to reinforce it. A case like this, you'll never get away with using chlorhexidine in a case like this. You know, we we always, always, always use Stella Life in these types of cases. And we use all three products. We do the 333 rule. Um, it works out fantastically in these cases. Like I said, we save a lot of money. Our patients heal up real nicely. You know, these are just examples. We've done a lot of these cases now, so nothing new for us. Other indications, just very, very quickly. Um, we can also use it for lateral window closure. And this is another case that's in our book, Dr. Nathan Estrin doing these, um, these cases here. Um, great periodontist. It's doing a lot of work down in Florida, in the Sarasota area. And also teaching courses, if anybody ever wants to learn, you know, you can learn directly from them of how we use these with PRF membranes and other things. This right here is probably my favorite indication of all of them. Um, this is a case of um, recession coverage where um, these PRF membranes, and I think this is probably my favorite indication of it. There's many ways to do this and the technology is advanced, but for those that have learned how to do the vestibular incision techniques, um, you can just pass these EPRF membranes through the tunnels. And uh, just to save a little time here, this was the case pre-op, you know, doing the surgeries. And these are split face studies as well. But, you know, using PRF instead of collagen. Now, you know, this isn't for everybody, obviously. I mean, this is just to demonstrate what can be done. There are certain rules and regulations here. You need a certain width of keratinized tissue, um, you know, two millimeters minimum. There's indications, but where you would typically use an alloderm, let's say, instead of a connective tissue graft, you can save all that money, not use that, use something that comes from your own body, um, biological, much cheaper, and it actually, the soft tissue will heal a little faster. And we're documenting these cases now. Um, this one here was done about two years ago. So, you know, we don't have like five, 10 year data as we would like, but um, you know, the early indications all point in the, in the right direction. All right. Last thing in the field of facial aesthetics, this is a, an absolute huge market for dentists. I mean, massive and, uh, way more money in the facial aesthetic field than in dentistry. And the cool thing about this new technology, which was really, uh, brought on by dentists is that we can use this as an all natural biological facial filler. So instead of using Juvederm and Restylane, we can make people look younger by using platelet concentrates and literally not, not just work on, you know, microneedling and vampire facials, but literally fill tissue. So when I look at this female, this is one that I treated with Dr. Scott Dobaccio. Um, we can fill the temples, the cheek area. We filled her chin a little bit. So when you start to see the orange peel look, that's volume loss. Um, I've been learning a lot about this space. Like I said, it's big opportunities. So we're just this is do a little what video um, to go over the biofiller bio looks, looks like. like. Okay, so if we look at this, this is coming right out of the bio heat here. This is in the, the practice at Lakewood Ranch Dental in Sarasota where Dr. Estrin and I work. That's what it looks like, the biofiller. That's your own blood, but it's been heated. It's been denatured. It literally looks like fat tissue. And so by being able to take this and put it back in the patients, like imagine injecting that, you know, in the tear trough area under somebody's eyes where the females complain, you know, I don't like my hollows. I don't like this. Like we don't need to use chemicals and we don't need to worry about allergic reactions or vascular occlusions or, I mean, it's an entirely safe material and it can be injected in those areas. And we've done a lot of these cases now, in fact, so much so that I partnered with a plastic surgeon, Catherine Davies, and wrote this book, PRF and Facial Aesthetics and all of its uses. So, um, you know, just to cover the implant size and the opportunities, all of dental implants is a $4.6 billion a year industry growing at 9% per year. All of dentistry is 
25 billion, growing at 6.7% per year. And the facial field is 31 billion, going to 119 billion, growing at 21% per year. And these are the numbers side by side. So there are over 30 states in in US that allow dentists to do these facial procedures. I mean, they are so easy to do. And and uh, when patients come in and ask, hey, do you do vampire facials and this and that? You know, we tell them literally, well, we can do a lot more. I mean, we can make biological fillers. We can do this, we can do that. And um, amazingly, even though my background is is perio and, and we've studied with, you know, I've, I've personally studied with the top periodontists and oral surgeons that I know, um, this happens to be the most popular course that we teach in Pure Up because we add a lot of instant income that Dennis can make uh, following these courses. So that's Catherine Davies right there. Obviously, she's an MD and, and is the lead contributor to the textbook. She's done a lot of work in that space. Um, and Holy we can stick. deliver the growth factors via different ways, via microneedling, vampire facials. Um, it thickens the skin. This is just very quick examples just to save a little time here on minimizing wrinkles, um, forehead lines, you know, the technology can be used in a lot of places. Active acne, that's an infection, right? We can take the PRF, go more specifically to the leukocyte layer and get rid of the bacteria. So that's an effective treatment with microneedling as well. Um, other area for young people, we like to do a lot of this stuff. So it just helps them with their self-esteem. Um, instead of putting this patient on Accutane, a, a drug that's not the greatest thing for this patient's liver, especially at the age that she is, you know, we can we can take an all natural strategy and use platelet concentrates for cases like that. And that's how we got to this type of case where we were able to do combination therapies, whether with lasers, microneedling, biofillers, uh, and other combo treatments. So, um, you know, we do a lot of these, these procedures and it happened in 2021, oddly enough, we created actually the Center for Advanced Rejuvenation and Aesthetics, uh, really focused on no chemicals, no filler, all natural regenerative sciences. And uh, this was Dr. Canner here. This is the practice owner that Dr. Nathan Estrin and I both worked out of. Um, I started to do more and more of these facial treatments and Dr. Estrin started taking over a lot more of the perio treatments. It was a lot of fun to work in this field. You know, we put up all these banners, you know, bio lifts and no chemicals, no fillers and what the laser does and microneedling. And, and uh, a lot of patients wanted these treatments done and, and we did a lot of them. Uh, with the same lasers we were using in dentistry. And uh, it worked out very well. And and in fact, one other dentist, David Kowski from Ohio said, I want to do something like this. Why don't we create a network amongst dentists that want to start taking advantage of these procedures and, and have a leg up on other med spas and start taking more money from med spas because it's such a huge market, you know, out of the $5 billion a year industry in dentistry, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we tap into this $120 billion industry in facial aesthetics? These procedures are, are much easier than placing dental implants and doing sinus grafting procedures. And so, um, you know, we started doing this with other colleagues. Dr. Kowski was the first to join Care Aesthetics Cleveland, um, you know, got all of our marketing material that we created down in Florida, and uh, he had success with it. And next thing you know, you know, 20 people joined. And then, uh, you know, fast forward two years since we launched this, there's now close to 150 clinics across the country in practically every state in the U.S., um, you know, and it's a real cool thing to see. And, you know, I hope we can keep growing this number. And the, the goal is literally to take our $25 billion a year industry and maybe double it by taking into by tapping into this huge market and facial aesthetics of all these people that want to do that. So we offer these courses every year, um, Pure F and Facial Aesthetics. You know, the last one we did was in Los Angeles. We got one coming up in November uh, in Florida. Um, you know, I hope to see a lot of people there. In fact, I know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but Estelle Life is also working on a a uh, product that improves wound healing after facial type treatments, after laser peels and other things. And, um, you know, we've been testing that as well. So for those that would like to become a care aesthetic provider, um, I'm more than happy to, to, to provide more info. These are little videos. Um, this is the last little video that I'm going to play. That's two minutes long. If you're a dentist in the room, I want you to think about this right here. Okay. This is a procedure that we do on this lady. It's a, called a BioCare. It's a treatment of lasers and Pure F. Um, we do two of these treatments per year on her. It's a $1,400 treatment. 
And out of the $1,400, she's got no problem spending that because otherwise she'd be spending that kind of money on Botox and fillers anyways. And the fact that she can now go in an all natural way, of course, for this lady here who's 70, this is a much better alternative for her. How many patients do you think would want to look younger like this lady, not have to use Botox and fillers, use lasers and pure F in an all natural way, and still spend the two, three thousand dollars, you know, per year that they're used to spending, but do it in natural ways. And then, you know, one of the things that Dr. Canner, the practice and owner, and I set up was we just said, well, you know, if this patient would want to spend three thousand dollars per year doing this, if we can find 300 such patients, only 300 in Sarasota, Florida, you know, 300 times 3,000 is basically nine, $900,000. We almost created a $1 million add-on to the dental practice by simply treating the exact same 300 patients every single year. Um, and, you know, we've done that very, very effectively. In fact, people come to the office all the time and and learn from us on, on how we actually did this. So it's actually been uh, pretty rewarding. And that's what all the kerosetic clinics aim to do. So when you watch this video, just ask yourself, do you have 300 such patients such as this one here in your practice? and I have had my three protocol series. Um, I felt like my forehead was in good shape, but things were beginning to sag and it was time to do something. And I did not want to go under the knife, that's for sure. So this is a nice, easy way to accomplish what I think is going to happen. All of those issues that I was concerned with when I came in here, I'm very satisfied and very happy with the end results. It was an interesting experience. Um, I didn't know what to expect, to be honest with you. I knew it was going to be laser. I did not know we were going to go inside the mouth. Um, I knew we were going to do some needling. Um, I've just been really happy with the process from day one when it first happened. It was like, you don't know what's going to go on. but. Um, when you get through that first treatment, you kind of get an idea of what's happening. I will have to say the procedure was certainly tolerable. I didn't experience any particular, if you call it discomfort or, or pain, if you will. And I'm sure there's different tolerations of, of pain, but um, you're doing it for beauty. You're doing it for an end result. So bottom line, it's all worth it. And it's, it's not very long. So if you experience some discomfort, then you can get through it because it doesn't last very long. Your advertisement, first of all, caught my eye. And when I read more about it, it even got more interesting, particularly because it was a natural way to um, get younger looking skin, hopefully. I'm 72 years old. And I didn't want to look like a 30 year old. I just want to look a, like a better, better version of myself. And that's what I've found, a better version of myself. So when you, you know, you can see obvious, very obvious improvements, obviously the patient's very happy, you know, for the dentists that own their own practices, how many such Nancy's exist in your practice, right? How many people would want to look younger, um, in all natural ways, you know, there's a lot of them. We do a lot of these treatments now and we've gotten quite comfortable. Uh, quite honestly, it's way easier than doing dentistry. And, um, you know, we can treat scars and other things. And just finding 300 such patients is really what we do. And treating scars such as this one. I mean, the technology of taking platelet-rich fibrin and using your own body's ability to heal itself um, in combination with lasers. This was a case here where a plastic surgeon said, there's no way we can treat your scar. We need to do a surgery. And, you know, this is actually extremely easy to treat. Um, I do this all day long. And so really big opportunities there for you. Oddly enough, of all the textbooks I've ever written or been part of, it was actually the PRF and facial aesthetic book that was most well sold. And, um, you know, a lot of patients were actually buying that book. And so quintessence asked me, you know, will you write a book that's much smaller. Um, it's a tiny little book. Actually, I've got one right here. Um, it's only a hundred or so pages. And um, it's literally just explains to patients what is what is PRF and what is the technology and facial aesthetics, you know, just gives a lot of illustrations 
um, you'll note that there's no author on it. The book was written literally to provide all of the other dentists that wanted to do these things uh, a blueprint of what to give patients and what to tell patients. It's only for dentists. And there's a whole chapter on why the dentist, why would you do a facial aesthetic treatment at the dentist? And boy, I love getting asked that questions because then I like to talk to them, you know, where do you do your Botox? You're going to nurses and physician assistants. Um, what do you think the education is like for facial anatomy and, and injections of a nurse versus a dentist, right? How much education do we do in facial head and neck anatomy versus anybody? Right. And when you learn how to do the treatments and you, you build up a little bit of confidence, you'll realize that it's a opportunity that is quite big. And, uh, you know, we can really take advantage of that. And, and uh, we combine a lot of, of treatments, dentistry with facial, you know, veneers, facials, ortho facial, um, a lot of opportunities for people that work in cosmetic dentistry as well. So don't underestimate how big that market is. You know, if there's one message that I'd leave with you guys is, you know, take a look at the opportunity that may exist in the city that you're at, because um, there is a lot of opportunities there. Um, so that's everything. Um, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to stay on for, um, you know, minutes, a few minutes and and, and uh, answer any questions. If anybody has questions, wants to reach out to me, ask me the protocols we use with Stell Life and PureF, um, how we make ePureF and or that want to join Kerasthetics, feel free to email me at any time. That's uh, that's my email address, rick at the myronlab.com. So that's everything. Dr. Myron, thank you so much on behalf of Stella Life and all of us. We so appreciate you. Um, I wanted to let you know there is um, a question in the chat that came in earlier. Um, the question is, uh, how do you do I genuinely consider the more expensive centrifuge from dental suppliers as against the ones in eBay? Do they actually make a difference? So, you know, there's a, a few things that you need to figure out when it comes to um, centrifuges. Number one, it has to be horizontal. So if you can find a horizontal one, that's great. Then it really depends on the, the size of the radius, right? So um, in a nutshell, this is where when we teach PRF courses, this is the number one mistake that people make. Okay. They don't understand the difference between RPM and RCF, the most common mistake I see made in this space. So the best way that I can explain this is that if if you have like a little child and you hold them right here and you're taught let's do one rotation per second so you start spinning you're doing one rotation per second with this little child right you're having a lot of fun because that's what you read that's the publication you should use right or that's the protocol you should use if you still do one rotation per second but let's say now you're holding a child on a on a 20 foot long string and you're whipping around the room right now so now you're boom and he's flying around this room even if you're still spinning at one rotation per second, obviously that child is going way faster, way out there than he is in here. And that might be actually terrifying for that child that's still spinning at one rotation per second, whether it be way over there versus in here, because he's going way faster, way bigger G-force. So you can use a machine of any size, right? We really care a lot about G-force, not RPM. But the problem is, is all these machines, they display RPMs. So if I tell you today, like, the protocol is 1,000 RPM for 10 minutes. You cannot use that machine on any, any centrifuge. It has to be a machine that is exactly this size and this diameter. Because if you use a machine that is this big, there's way more G-force that's created. It's going a lot faster. And unfortunately, everything goes outwards and downwards to the bottom of the tubes. But we take pure from the top of the tubes. So that's a huge mistake that people make. It doesn't mean that you can't use a machine that's this big. It just means that it needs to be properly calibrated. So if we develop protocols on a machine this big, that's a thousand RPM for 10 minutes, okay? It creates a certain G-force, right? Let's say 200 G. Well, if you have a machine that's this big, you can still create 200 G and make PRF properly, but your protocol might have to be 500 RPM for 10 minutes, right? So it's just a matter of doing the actual um, studies to figure out exactly what that protocol should be and what G-force, uh, matching the G-forces essentially. So it can be done. Now, 
I we've published actually work probably in 2019 or 2020 where all these companies had different centrifuges and they were all, they just didn't understand it. So I told all the companies, Salvin, you know, Interspin, Duo Quattro, I took all the machines in and I said, guys, you don't understand how cells separate. Send me all of your machines. I will write the protocols down for every single one of these machines. And that was back with fixed angle devices. So it, the answer, the short answer is yes, absolutely. You just have to make sure that that machine you can calculate the g-force essentially and or you know you have a lab that you can go to to figure out where where the proper uh, cells are going thank you dr myron we have another couple of questions what is the next class on the west coast and how do you charge patients for aesthetic treatment um next course on the west coast is probably in february so we're going back for another facial course february um, I believe it's eight to 10th or anyways, it's on the pure FED website. We always try and go to the West coast at least two, three times per year. Um, how do we charge patients? Well, there's just standard in the fields, right? So in dentistry, the add-on fee to use PRF typically in most offices is about $295. That's the average. That's what we recommend in the courses. Some people charge more than that. Um, for aesthetic treatments, it's very well known that people that do, for example, microneedling with PRF, that's a $700 treatment. And the big advantage that we have is that, you know, PRP kits used to be like $100, $150. So a lot of aesthetic practices still, they still have to absorb this extra $100 and $150 cost. We can get better platelet concentrates for like $5. So they're used to doing microneedling for, you know, $350, $400 with PRP is $700. We just charge the $700, same fee. We can explain all day long why PRF's better. Um, and that's basically what we charge. Then when we start adding things like biological fillers, right? When we actually do the injections to fill volume under the eyes or cheekbones or temples or whatever it may be, um, that treatment with microneedling is $1,100. And then when we add lasers, we charge $1,400. So there's different scales and different things we do. You know, just like anything else, a lot of these patients in the aesthetic world, you tell them that, you know, this is a little better than this and then a little better than this. They typically, they go straight to the best thing. And most of them will want to do the the more expensive treatments, at least from my experience. I live in Florida though. So it could be different a little bit elsewhere. But again, the nice thing is, is that our care doctors, you know, we've got 150 practices across the country and, you know, we get data basically from everybody what's working what's not working we share it collectively as a group as a kerosetic group and the nice thing is is we put all of our before and after cases in a in a portal so when the new care doctor first starts and he wants to talk about what what should i expect when i do this treatment with PRF and and lasers well there's literally like 500 cases before and afters and these doctors that just join can just flip through these and show patients like look at all these results you know um, and and we've got people everywhere from all different races to uh, different parts of U.S. So, you know, pretty well, um, uh, you know, I hope that answers the question. I think it did. Thank you so much. We have one more or actually two more. Um, there also is a question about the November course. Uh, what it, When is that one and what is the cost? And I believe you mentioned they might be able to locate a lot of this information on your website. Yeah, the November course is our big one that we do every year. Um, it's November 16th to 18th. So that's uh, coming up in Fort Lauderdale. And then, you know, we have courses a little bit everywhere. Um, I mean, all across, all across the country. I mean, every city you can imagine pretty much, or the bigger cities. So Texas and Oklahoma, I believe are on your, probably Texas is on your sites. Yes, Texas, uh, we go to every year. Actually, we just got back from San Antonio. And uh, we'll be back there next year. We're there every year. Um, absolutely. Wonderful. Last question we have tonight is, how do you do the TMJ injections with PRF? Actually, that's a very good point. And uh, one of the people that I work very closely with, his name is Dr. Jared Cornell. Um, you know, he's the person that runs courses related to that, but I've taken it. It's a fantastic program. And essentially... Um, there's a three, three injections that you do for the joint spaces. It's very comfortable for patients. 30 gauge needle, one inch is typically what's done. Um, I'd have to show you the slides of how it's done. And, uh, we, 
well, you'd have to learn if you don't do them already, you'd have to learn when to do that versus uh, uh, Botox. So you can obviously inject in the masseter and temporal and or do both in combination. But when we do the joint injections in, in uh, TMJ, it's an $800 treatment that's typically charged. Patients are quite happy with those. So a lot of research in that space too. So every single month, there's a new publication on PureF use in joint spaces. So I think that's a growing field, especially for dentists. It's right in their wheelhouse because so many people have uh, joint pain. Oh, wonderful. In our chat, if you are interested, we put the link for prfedu.com. Please copy that. And we'll have recorded this uh, meeting tonight with uh, Dr. Myron. So if you'd like to learn more about PRFEDU, please go to his website. Dr. Myron, this is a world-class lecture. Amazing information incredible results and just something that is so innovative in our world of dentistry. Again, from all of us at Stella Life, we can't thank you enough for joining us tonight, for allowing us to learn so much. And I know there's going to be a whole lot more to come in the next couple of years. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Dr. Myron. Absolutely. Um, always a pleasure and uh, always looking forward to catching up and seeing new innovations and pairing them with uh, with your products. So thank you so much for actually improving outcomes in, in our own patients as well. So much appreciated and always, always a pleasure to be on with you guys. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.